Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Earth Climate Dreams, Depth Psychological Reflections in the Age of the Anthropocene. And we continue our program now with Sally Gillespie, who is the author of two books and is also a union psychotherapist in Sydney. Hi, Sally. Thanks so much for spending some time with us today. Hello, Bonnie. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you with me, and I know that the focus of your particular conversation today is going to be around climate change, and particularly uh, around how we really need to be talking about climate change, but with depth. And so I think it's a highly relevant topic, and I, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So before we go further, I'm going to go ahead and read your bio so that we have that uh, as some background for you, and then we'll just jump into the conversation. Sally Gillespie is the author of two books on psychotherapy and dreams, as well as a number of book chapters, including two in Depth Psychology, Disorder, and Climate Change, edited by Jonathan Marshall. Sally practiced as a union psychotherapist in Sydney for over 20 years and served as the president of the C.G. Jung Society of Sydney from 2006 to 2010. She is currently writing a book based on her doctoral thesis, which explored the psychological experience of sustained climate change engagement. Sally is a member of both Psychology for a Safe Climate and the Climate Wellbeing Network, and she works as a casual academic in the Social Ecology Department of Western Sydney University. So Sally, again, uh, just so happy to have you here. And I really love that this particular conversation is going to be focused so much on climate change because of course your background is very unique in the sense that you have both the depth psychology background as well as you are actively working in these initiatives that are focused on climate change. And I've heard you talk about these many times. And so I know that you have a, a real, not only a firm grasp of climate change issues and what's happening with that, but you also have that capacity to bring that depth psychological perspective, which is really where we, you know, we need that bridge so much today to be able to begin to just understand what's happening and how we can go about creating our own change in the world and related to the topic. So maybe we can just launch by talking a little bit about, <laughs> about talking about climate change, which is kind of an, an interesting entree, I think, because it's what we're here to do. But I think in general society, it's a very difficult topic. And I often find myself hesitant to actually bring it up in common uh, situations or conversations because people's opinions are very diverse, for one thing, and, um, and it can be quite controversial as well. So that seems like to me like a good place to start. Why do you think that we don't necessarily talk about climate change? Uh I think there's a number of factors there, and certainly it's become a bit of a social taboo at the dinner party. You know, it's we'll talk about sex, we'll talk about money easier than we'll talk about climate change, and often you can hear that sort of palpable indrawing of breath when the references or the topic is opened. Partly, I think, on the conscious level, because yes, it's a polarizing issue, and is this going to then stop a social interaction that's been going well? Because we don't know how people respond, and I think. A lot of us have had surprises, you know, when we've assumed that people's picture will be like our own. We've got a sense of, you know, simpatico with someone and, and we always then tend to assume they, they tend to see things the way we do. But there is a very diverse and polarised kind of positions around climate change on a uh, political level. But beneath that, I think there's just so much going on emotionally. Um, and so with that is that kind of fearfulness about what are we going to stir up in other people, but I think there's also a great fear about what are we going to stir up in ourselves um, when we go into this. And so what I often see is when the topic comes up is there's a deflection. Very often there's a joke, you know, where we'll all be underwater by then or, or whatever or something. Uh, and I, I see that as a, a defensive deflection that, that goes on or, or a change of topic or whatever. Uh, and there is a protective, I, I know I, I've, you know I've talked about this with friends, I was remember when I was doing my doctorate and I was talking with a, a friend who's a, a therapist and just starting to mention a couple of things and she's turned to me and says, you've got to stop talking about this. It's making me too anxious. I'm not up to this today. And I really appreciate it because you know, she's got that consciousness. She could articulate it. But very often people don't have that consciousness uh, necessary or, or the ability to articulate it like that. Um, and I, I, I'd say that we could talk about it on other days, but uh, 
yeah, there's so much anxiety that's there. And under the anxiety, there is fear, there's dread, there's feelings of hopelessness that come, come up and, and dis disempowerment, um, grief. Just, just, it's just a, ve a very loaded emotional um, area to venture into. Yes, and I think that to your point, a lot of people maybe are not necessarily as aware of just how emotionally invested they actually are because we are as a culture, and I mean this fairly globally, so good as humans at really sort of stuffing those emotions, whether it's repressing them or distracting ourselves with all different kinds of other behaviors that allow us to not think about the things that you know are, are frightening to us or um, or think about the, you know, even, even the things that we know we can do about it that many of us are doing can still be really disconcerting on some level because every time I go to recycle something, I can't help but think, you know, it's just not enough. There's so much that needs to be done. And, and this is really a Titanic that is, is not easy to turn on a dime. And, and I, I don't know if we're going to be able to turn it quite frankly. So I, I think part of the question then arises is not only, you know, what, what about the psychological implications of climate change and, and what happens when we talk about it is also really what happens when we don't talk about it because so much of that is still left in the unconscious as well. That's right. And I guess, you know, the crux of what I'm working around here is that we need to have those conversations because the emotional content of them is not only so deep, it's so wide ranging uh, and that we cannot contain them unless we carry them out into the large, we need more than one person to think of through climate change, you know, and I think that's why it can get very depressing sitting there thinking about it by yourself. Whereas my experience is when we take it into group conversation, there is a whole diversity of, of responses which are, are all ones that we can feel in ourselves at different times and they need to all be held and articulated. Um, so the more we don't talk about it, the more we don't, don't act um, because we're not building the psychological resilience nor the political consciousness, I think, to be able to work with such an incredibly difficult and complex issue. Mm. I, I can't hear you, Bonnie. <laughs> I was uh, so, you know, you mentioned you brought this up and that's the whole political aspect of things. And I, I was just wondering if maybe you could say some more about the political piece of things, because that's also something that many people that I know choose to avoid. And it probably depends on what's going on in the political climate at the moment. But po politics and climate change are so intertwined that it's really hard to talk about one without talking about the other. So in the process of engaging with climate change, do you find that you you run into political issues on a regular basis yes and I think we need to I don't think there's any way we can engage effectively with climate change without growing our political consciousness and what interests me and I guess what came out of the the um, doctorate re doctoral research I did was a, a really exciting and fresh understanding about how psychological development and political development uh, can be and should be and have to be intertwined in the case of climate change. So that we, from the psychological level, we can help um, develop that kind of resilience, um, that psychological resilience that's needed to stay engaged with climate change, because it is very gruelling. I, I do work with climate activists in terms of supporting. Uh, and it's it's a... You know, when it's just a small group of people who are really consciously grappling with that issue every day, they're bearing a huge psychological burden. Um, and it's in terms of, you know, we can do all the delving psychologically and, you know, a lot's being written and it's great stuff to, you know, this, this, um, a depth psychological view has been very helpful, particularly in looking at the causes of denial. Uh, around climate change and the process of psychological defense mechanisms and so on. Um, 
but we need to marry that with uh, an understanding of political consciousness. Um, the person who's really inspired me around this when I was doing my work was uh, a Jungian analyst called Lawrence Elshuler. Uh, and he did some great work, not around climate change, but around uh, liberation movements. And he looked at particularly the way the model of individuation works in terms of developing psychological maturity. And then he held that up next to Paolo Freire's model of development of political consciousness or conscientization it's called and though he and he saw a three-step process in both cases not the same but you know they had a really interesting parallels and in the end what happens I think is as we develop a maturity psychologically as we develop as we develop a maturity psychologically we learn to go beyond the ego in our um, understanding and our perceptions about life we lose you know we can move a little bit away from that one-sided position hopefully as the ego relativizes what happens at a political level the level of political consciousness development is we can move beyond a kind of a consciousness which Palafrey called a naive consciousness where we look at problems in very individualistic terms and we do a lot of naming and blaming uh, and when we go move beyond that, we go again into a larger understanding. In that larger understanding, we can look at how problems are systemic and how we need collective action in order to respond to them. And, you know, the crux of climate change action politically is no one can come and be the saviour or be the hero here. It has to grow out of collective action. Uh, and that collective action has to grow out of a change of world, world views, you know, a change of myth. So there's a really interesting way that the psychological and political can feed into each other. But I think at a, psycholo for a psychological level, we need to move into that. We need to take that psychological understanding into an actual socio-political understanding of, around collective knowledge forming and collective action. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it occurs to me as you're talking that I think one reason that I personally sometimes avoid the political piece of things is because it feels very extroverted to me, and mm -hmm. I don't really identify with that extroverted piece of it. In, in fact, I you know, prefer the introverted way of things. And so for me, sometimes I think that, uh, that serves to actually prevent me from looking at it in the way that I need to or being able to open my own lens a little bit to understanding the, the political side of things in order to initiate that change. I wonder if you've run into that at all. When you talk about the people that you've been working with and supporting as a psychologist, they are primarily not psychologists, I take it. And yeah. so maybe, maybe, and you've mentioned a few of these depth psychological ways that need to come into this. Uh, I wonder if you can just be, maybe offer us some concrete way that you actually end up taking that into the world in a very extroverted way, by the way, and, and working with people who are not necessarily looking at it from a depth psychological standpoint? Well, I think a few things to answer. One is I'm incredibly introverted myself. And yeah, I don't get real excited about running out to the barriers and, and yelling and screaming, though I do, I do go to, to some rallies uh, and take some actions there. But the thing is, climate change as an issue is a lifelong one. It's not going to go anywhere, you know. We, so we have to find resilient forms and resilient ways of uh, interacting with it. And I think because of the, it's such a wide scope, there's plenty of room there to find a way of engaging that goes along with your passion. I mean, this is exactly what you're doing now, Bonnie. You've set up this, this whole symposium to open up conversations and you've accessed it through your passion. So this idea that we have to kind of put ourselves into a mold and be a certain kind of activist in order to be politically responsible and engaged is, is not something I go along with. As we're talking about, you know, collective action, anything that actually acknowledges that we are part of a, 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 a collective and not, you know, what we do have to challenge is that old, very individualistic view of the psyche. Um, and I think there's quite a lot that's happening within psychological movements. Um, I'm thinking particularly works around psychologies of liberation by you know, Mary Watkins and Elaine Shulman and so on helps. In terms of depth psychology supporting activists who, as you say, don't often have very much psychological background at all, they're often, yeah. Um, 
uh, very engaged with the actions and often quite young too. Um, I, I, in a way, it's, it's quite simple. We just, I, we go in, uh, I work with a team of people and start conversations. How are you feeling? How are you doing? There can be, a t for, for many people at that level, a bit of a taboo around discussing feelings and a fear of discussing feelings because this sort of feeling of fighting, this feeling of hopelessness or despair. Uh, and so giving that experience that we know so well in depth psychology of actually creating an open and safe space to actually say it how it is and to experience that at a group level where what I've found is in a group, yes, some person may talk about being very despairing, um, but someone else is talking about feeling very inspired and we need that's what happens in a group. You, you don't find in a group everyone's in the same place. It, it, and what, we re what comes out of this is an understanding that at an individual level as well as a group level, there'll be a great fluctuation of feelings going on. Uh, and in depth psychology is very good at supporting that and very good at understanding that we, when well supported, we do develop strength and resilience from being able to look and accept difficult and constraining realities and then coming into a more realistic position of response there. Yes, I, I imagine you're speaking of the container, at least that's the image that's coming up for me, is just this amazing container in which all of this can be held and sometimes it's not that things have to or that we even expect things to happen immediately in that case, but rather it becomes almost an alchemical process in the sense that all of these thoughts and feelings and actions and the personalities of both the people that are there and all of the things that are going on in the outer world are all kind of poured into this you know, mixer and it's all just in there and it's steeping on some level and there will be change that happens. Carl, you talked about that on a regular basis about how we have to really hold the tension of a situation, uh, often containing many opposites, not even just two opposites, but to just hold that and not rush to try to take action or necessarily rush to make some judgment or to label it or define it or any of that, but to just to allow it. That's the word that's really coming to mind. And, and, and yet it's an allowing that's also a witnessing because if we aren't witnessing it and and really paying attention with intention, then it just becomes a, you know, a, more of a spectator sport, which uh, is something that Mary Watkins and Helene Lorenz talk about. And I think it's quite, quite powerful, actually, to talk about this whole witnessing piece of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but has that been your experience primarily that, that usually when you are able to create this kind of container that uh, you do see transformation take place, whether immediately or over the course of time? Yes, well, certainly the, the biggest experience I've had with this was with the doctoral research where we had a group which met over a year um, for 12, we had 12 two hour sessions. And the people there were not, didn't have psychological backgrounds particularly, but they were all engaged in climate change in some way or other. And I, I really, you know, I thought, oh, I'll probably have st need stimulus materials or something to kind of guide the conversation. But as soon as we all sat down, I said, well, we're here to be able to talk openly and honestly about how we really feel. The conversation just took off. And I, I did talk about the tension of opposites at one point fairly early on. And that idea was picked up very strongly, which was interesting, you know, considering people didn't have the background. Because I think there is so much polarisation externally around climate change issues, but also because we were able to very early identify on how, how fluctuating the seesaw of our own emotions. And a further story about this, as I invited people to share dreams as part of the process, you know, not that we could work with them in great depth, but I said, you know, but depth psychology needs to find, you know, an aim of depth psychology is to give the space to the silence, it's, it's to give a, a focus and words to what is often in the silence. So I thought, well, if we listen to dreams, you know, if people are prepared to bring dreams along that feel in some way connected to our work here, we might be learning something or getting things articulated which is what happened. But a very early dream a woman brought was of holding and nursing twin babies in her arms and one was black and one was white. And how totally focused she was and in love with both equally. 
and we came to that we we held that image for you know she held the babies we held that image of that the of the opposite and yet the same babies the black and the white um and what we experienced, you know, through the course of that group is that people who had started in a state of despair and, and, and depression in several cases went into optimistic places. People who came and said, oh, look, it's all going to be all right. I don't hold with any of this, this, this gloom and doom would go, you know, halfway through the process. Well, you know, I've really not been feeling too hopeful of late. And, and so really there's a lot of shifting around. But what came out at the end was that everyone said they felt more resilient, they felt more able to engage. And a number of people said quite spontaneously, I feel like I've somehow grown up a bit. And it wasn't that we were doing any particular processes. We were, we, were, we were just doing that kind of sharing, which allowed us to articulate a lot of things that um, had been suppressed or cut off from or censored within ourselves in some ways. And I think a lot of owning of projections went on too, um, which easily comes up in this realm. So that was all great work of you know, psychologically developmental work that was, was that was going on simply through the process of the safe holding of conversations in depth, yeah, which inviting greater honesty. Yes, and, and what really occurs to me is just how powerful working with dreams became in the group. I mean, the image that you shared with us about the two babies, this really had an effect on me at the moment that you were talking about that. I had my own sort of somatic experience, I think, of, of just holding those opposites. And, and that's what we were just talking about. So it seems like really one of the core pieces that depth psychology can bring to the conversation is the capacity to bring the images into it. And not just images that are fearful or causing fear, like a lot of people do have those projections you just mentioned. I mean, I have them myself, you know, I live, I live at sea level, not too far from a large body of water. So I have that, that those own projections of, you know, what's it going to be in the next few years or the next decade or two or whatever it is. And, and of course, <laughs> anytime I turn on the news, you hear all of these just horrific stories about what we're doing to the planet and and uh, often these become social issues when you hear about mines that are happening in different parts of the world and how it's displacing people how places are being deforested of course I could go on and on and each one of those images that I just presented is an image and it's quite a negative Im image for me the way that I experience it but there's something so powerful to being able to take those images and actually again just hold them because they become doorways into something else, something different than our everyday sort of way that we are trying to cope with all of this, again, whether we're conscious of it or not conscious of it. And I'm very aware that we, as a culture, do everything in our power on some level to distract ourselves from our fears around what's happening or our, our just extreme dismay around what's happening. So I wonder if you can say more about images and, and maybe if you have other images that you could share or other experiences of people sharing images that really you felt was one of those doorway kind of situations where it opened into something new where people could actually become transformed because of the image and the work with the image. Mm. Um, yes, well, certainly that one around the holding of the babies was, what was, was one of that, which I think for the group developed the resilience to, as we collectively went into it, to, to do the collective witnessing, which is really, when you mentioned those kind of images we get from, the, from looking in the paper every day, bring up underneath a tremendous sense of grief um, and to be able to hold that grief. Early on in that particular experience, the, the group, we had quite a lot of nightmares. In fact, everyone shared a nightmare by the end of the process, but most of them came early on. Um, and I think we particularly not only needed the nightmares to help us articulate our sense of uh, dread and feelings of hopelessness and so on but we also needed them i think to face into death and we had a lot of discussions around death uh, particularly in the first kind of six months but they, they, they were there all the way through um, 
and I remember during about halfway through someone presented of being in a hospital and seeing this man who was very sick and, and was, you know, and pulling back and being so frightened of this man and his illness. Um, and yet when she looked at him again, there was a kind of a brightness and a lightness around him, which totally confused her in the dream. And we had a long talk about this in the group because um, we all kind of got drawn in to, to the intensity of the dream experience she'd had and the complexity of her responses. Um, and I think it was interesting, yes, in, in the dream when she withdrew from the man, she, found, she herself found herself in a wheelchair. Um, and so we could use that, I think, to, to talk about how someone might have an, a sickness but yet be well. Um, and our, our varying responses around, around illness and death and destruction um, and threat and all those things which were very personalised in the dream but which could make a relationship to the kind of issues that, that climate change brings up. Uh, and they're learning kind of to be with. I mean, I guess similar as, as with the babies. There's, there's um, a being with, and I think the witnessing, that collective witnessing is very important. Uh, another dream someone brought was of uh, floods across the world, very apocalyptic sort of sense, and then meeting uh, and looking uh, as she went through this world, she came uh, across um, a well-known actress, Nicole Kidman, and she was controlling a computer scenario and looking at a whole picture of the world and, said, and she said, it's all right, it's all right, you know, we can look at this. And, and her association with that particular, uh, with Nicole Kimmel as well, someone who's very competent and able to deal with things. And I think these, these kind of different images of fear of looking into it, and yet if we can stay with it, we can find a way of being with it which is a well way of being with it, even though outcomes are uncertain or looking bad. Uh, so I think that was definitely one of the things that got worked through in the dreams there um, uh, in different ways. Um, These are really beautiful images that you're sharing. And I, I know you and I have actually both been in a dream group together really focused yeah. around these kinds of images and ideas and for me it's it's been extremely rich and one thing that has come up a lot <laughs> well in addition to you know you mentioned I guess I will say first you mentioned three words here that uh, are bound to come up I think in any real authentic conversation around this the first is grief of course mm -hmm. which is really a powerful word and I often wonder how it is that we're dealing with that in our society um, actually, before I go on, maybe we could we could address that for just a moment because I do think it's a, a critical piece of it. And leading up to this, not that many people are willing to talk about that. Even psychologists have a hard time, I think, probably like you and I, bringing that up in, in just a regular kind of situation. Obviously, the container is not there for that. And yet grief is such a deep felt process that... It, it is part of what we need to be having these conversations about. And then again, where are the containers for that? So I think I'm kind of talking in circles around this whole thing, but, but it comes back to having those containers in which we can actually talk about it. And then uh, having processes by which we're actually enabling people to share the feelings of grief that they're having. Can you just say more about grief in general and maybe your experience of when it comes up for you in these kinds of situations? I, I think, uh, yes, several things. One is our culture, our Western culture, does not deal with grief, you know, full stop, uh, or death. And climate change is so provocative at a psychological level because grief uh, and awareness of death are right on the surface there when we look at what's going on. Um, and yes, you're right, it, it's unavoidable. We have grief about the losses out there. I mean, the rate of species extinction is an, it just phenomenal. I mean, it's just so appalling. Um, there's the grief of places 
which uphold a tremendous symbolic and iconic value in the world. I mean, Australia here, 70% of the Great Barrier Reef was bleached this summer. And it's, you know, looking very uncertain that it will be able to recover in any, any healthy way. Uh, and then there's the griefs of our own lives. Um, the kind of changes, you know, part of bringing the, this consciousness climate change into consciousness is it changes the way we see ourselves and it changes our expectations of life. A little dream I shared in, in, the, in that group was of this lovely little seaside cottage for sale. And it was just the sort of seaside cottage I'd kind of picture myself in, in my retirement, but I just saw it slide into the ocean as the coast was eroded. And I felt that that was sort of symbolic of so many kind of dreamed of uh, pictures of our futures and of our world just collapsing. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I don't, you know, my vision about my retirement is not about seaside cottages. It, you know, and there's both an expansion in that and there's a grief in that too. There's a grief in I don't think of going overseas for, ho for holidays anymore. That doesn't, it just, it doesn't feel like a kind of a martyristic kind of sacrifice. It just doesn't feel um, consonant with with the way the world is and I don't want to be sort of purist about this and I'm, uh, you know I might never do it I'm you know some circumstance might come up but it's it's not an easy assumption that that's and there's there's a lot of things that that awareness changes those assumptions on those personal level um, but the, and there's there's grief for our, our children and grandchildren or all the children and I feel that very strongly too. In the last few years, we had our teenage niece come live with us. And with that kind of came, you know, at times discussions about climate change. What do, what do I say to young people? Um, how, how do you say it? What's the right sort of information? And what are we neglecting to help the children with if we're not alerting them to the fact that life is not going to continue in the way it is here, given what's going on right now? And I think the only way we can really open up to these griefs so we can keep working with the issue is to do some collective holding together. I think ceremony and ritual is very important. I was at a major climate rally at the end of last year in Sydney. And there was a lot of political speeches, you know, and all of this about how terrible everything was and um, various things. I could feel it was a very large crowd. And I can feel the mood just lowering and lowering, um, as well as a sort of a lot of feelings underneath. And then they said, now we're going to have a minute's silence just to mark, to mark, you know, the losses the people have already lost through climate change and what's going on here. And suddenly this whole crowd of tens of thousands of people were silent for the minute and it was just palpable just the feeling of ah, the space just the space to feel all of this and then that was ended with this most remarkable still can feel the shivers didgeridoo playing and it was full of emotion and including grief there was a mourning and there was a wailing and there was a kind of if you know the didgeridoo you can get these kind of shrieking calls as well as the dirge like undertone kind of awakening and the whole mood of the crowd and that event just changed from there on. And people were active. When the march came, people were, you know, celebrating, celebrating the energy of the crowd and the commitment to act. So I really think the place of the arts and the rituals, spiritual holdings, all of that is extremely important. Yes, yes, I agree with you. And you're making me think of a, mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to attend an event with Joanna Macy one time. Mm -hmm. Most people listening to this will probably know who she is, a Buddhist scholar who cares deeply about ecology and has done a, a tremendous amount of work on the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and she was speaking in conjunction with another woman who was actually providing music. And it was just such a profound um, dialogue between the two of them where Joanna Macy would say a few words and then they would launch into some music. Uh, this other woman, Jennifer Berezon was her name, was playing music. And I have to say, I mean, I attended that for about four hours and I just could not stop crying. It just activated something for me. And, and what it activated for me was such a tremendous, deep, powerful love for the planet and for all beings and all things. And, and so it was a grief 
about the loss and what we are doing to the planet and, and the things that we are losing. So it was tr tremendously about grief of loss, but it was also, it felt very purifying on some level. And so I think to your point, integrating the arts and bringing in the ceremony and the ritual, it was done very much in a sacred manner. Uh, it was people gathered in community who were all there caring about the same thing, being together in the same room, being willing to show their emotions, share their emotions, go into their emotions, feeling safe in doing that, regardless of the consequences, trusting that there was something bigger at work there that I think would take care of all of us. And, and I can't, you know, on some level, when I think about that, I can't imagine any other way, right? How, how else are we going to get through this? It's certainly not going to be one person at a time rationally trying to figure out how we're going to avoid it because it's coming <laughs> I think on some level and I don't say that to to frighten people or to be an alarmist I just think that most of us probably feel that on some level and so it's a matter of articulating it more That's so. right. yeah and helping communities already going through those losses I know there's been a lot of fires in the states and there's a lot of floods and here in Australia we've had tremendous flooding just in the last week or so mm. so these events are accelerating they're intensifying and you know, communities all over the world are, are having to, to find ways of working with their grief and, and rebuilding and at the same time knowing that if, you know, there's not more work done on, on climate change um, mitigation, this, this, this is going to continue. And so, yes, and it's I guess it's finding all the different ways that we can acknowledge the grief and death, acknowledge, acknowledge the ways that it's taboo, and then find according to what kind of forums you're in, whether you're in small groups or larger groups, or, you know, uh, spiritually orientated or, or, or not, but that we, we find these, these ways. Yeah. Yes, and, and I, I wanted to point out, uh, Sally, along those same lines, in your bio, we had mentioned that you had a couple of chapters in the book called Depth Psychology Disorder and Climate Change that was edited by Jonathan Marshall. I happen to have a copy of that book. Um, I don't know if it's still widely available. I grabbed it a few years ago when I saw it because it was just so right on topic for me and, and you know, right along the lines of my own passion. But one of your chapters in there is called Descent in the Time of Climate Change. Mm. And in it, you do talk about uh, looking at things mythologically and being and you had mentioned earlier in this conversation about the you know the myth the prevalent myth at hand and I think probably most of us would agree that we need a new myth because the, the story that we are living today as a collective culture is really not serving us very well. I wonder if you can say more about the idea of descent because I think this plays right into uh, another thing that you said earlier about how uh, in the dream group that you were talking about, people are maturing and changing and moving perhaps to a different stage of things. So I don't know if you connect all that in your mind. It's, it's a leap I'm kind of making, but, but there's this whole piece about the descent, which in my mind becomes an initiation and then what can be the result of that? Yeah. You know, one of the uh, uh, thoughts that really inspired me as I was writing the, the thesis was um, something Jeanette Paris said, and she said, you know, the space between the old myth and the new myth is a deadly zone. And that's where we are. And I guess one of the things that bores me is, you know, we talk about, oh, where's the new myth and where's it going to come from? Like it's going to sort of arrive. Um, but actually we're in this deadly zone and the sense of death, uh, which is with us as we face now, not only climate change, but all sorts of dis destructions, which are emanating out of a lot of ways of living on this planet, which is mythically based, you know, we look at the myth of capital, capitalism or, or, or globalization or whatever, whatever, that are not able within the ideologies to really acknowledge uh, the relationship to, to nature and, and insist on seeing nature as this sort of bucket of resources, which is free. So we're looking for, we know this myth isn't gonna work ongoingly you know it's, it's it's at its finite so we're in this deathly place and when we're in the deathly place mythologically we go into the underworld uh i mean the myth that kind of most inspires me around that and has for many many years is the myth of anana and erish kigo which is one of the oldest recorded myths from sumerian times and 
Uh, I don't know if we've got time to tell that myth. I presume people will, will know it. Um, but what happens down there in the underworld when the Queen Anana goes down and visits her twin sister, Erish Kegel, who is in a rage of grief because her husband's died and because no one acknowledges her or her grief. And she dismembers Anana in her rage and hangs her on the talk upside down. Um, and I think... For us who live such privileged lives in the West, many of us, we have had this queen-like existence and this kind of descent that climate change is sending us into is, you know, we're kind of compelled to go down there. Everyone told her, no, 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 don't go down, don't go down, it won't end well. But she knew she had to and we have to go down to, to pull apart a lot of our old assumptions and a lot of our old beliefs and values which are, are not only unsustainable, they're destructive, they're destructive of life on this planet, they're destructive of others, and they're destructive of our own psyche and their distortions. And, you know, hanging on the meat hook and who knows what form that's going to take, you know, it's it's not a quick process, all this, this letting go and uh, we can anticipate and volunteer for some of it. Some of it's going to go way beyond we want, might, what we might want to volunteer for. But, you know, what gets Anana out of that underworld is the little creatures that are created. Um, Enki, you know, the god of compassion. And these little creatures come down and they mirror Erish Kegel's grief. So when she says, oh, great is my woe, and shreds this, they go, oh, great is your woe, Erish Kegel. Oh, how you suffer. And it is that empathic comp compassion which then melts Erish Kegel sufficiently to release Anana and send her back into the world where she then wreaks more vengeance um, on others, on her husband, um, the Muzis. But I think that process is we have to be dismembered and we have to, all the naivety, just as Persephone lost all her naivety down in the underworld in, in her descent, um, and be and come up and come up not knowing um and yet in some way empowered by having faced not knowing what's going to happen but empowered by by having faced into what has been avoided and because it's avoided life process is so distorted yeah. yes a couple of things struck me about what you said and that is well first of all the the little creatures and they aren't named we don't quite know what they are i guess um, I envision them as gnats, maybe, or little flies that come around. But, but in, in many ways, they represent two of the topics that we've been talking about here a little bit. One is the idea of witnessing mm -hmm. and, of course, empathy. Because when you wholly witness something rather than being just a spectator, then you begin to be able to mirror back those feelings. So, and the more that those fear, feelings are mirrored back, the more that someone can move into them. It, it creates a field of its own that is not one person and not the other, but something different entirely. I guess it's Jung's transcendent function, as he called it, that capacity for something new to arise and, mm. and to develop. And then the other thing that occurs to me is those little creatures were truly what in Jungian psychology we call the other. And of course, the other is anything that we don't identify, recognize, acknowledge, and own for ourselves. Of course, it is part of us, but often we can only see it on the outside, and uh, and it's, it becomes what's called the shadow, right? And so it occurs to me that uh, animals particularly definitely hold that place of the other in this scenario because they are not human. And in the age of the Anthropocene, where humans are the front and center and have you know, created so much havoc and, and had such an impact on our planet, the animals are very much the ones that are suffering. And so I'm always very much struck, you had mentioned the mass extinction just briefly earlier as we were speaking. And uh, maybe as we begin to bring this to a close, we could, we could talk for a few minutes about the other and, and that is in the form of the animal. Have you had images that come up of animals or is there anything about the extinction that has struck you more than another? How do animals come into all of this? The, I had a huge series of dreams that kind of pulled me into this and, and they were quite apocalyptic and quite despairing in, in their tone. But in each of those dreams, an animal leapt into my arms. Mm. And I feel like that animal self both helped me to not you know, go into that kind of 
frame of mind I actually held in one of the dreams was, oh, when are, when are humans going to go extinct so the seas can be restored and the, the, the fish, fish can thrive? And to understand we're in it together. We are so in it together. And the animals don't want to punish us. We carry a lot of guilt. I mean, it's not that the animals want to punish us. They just want us to, to be with them, to, 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 to work. We know animals will work in partnership with humans beautifully. Um, but are we humans really acknowledging our, our um, capacity, uh, abilities and, and need to work in relationship to the, to, to the animal and to the other? And that's one of the things that makes me a little bit nervous about the Anthropocene sometimes. I mean, as a myth, you know, as a myth term, it's, it's fantastic. Fantastic in, in that it really brings up to the forefront of our consciousness that this is the kind of power that uh, humans are exerting over the earth. We're actually shaping a geological era. Um, at, but at the same time, it's not all of our humans, you know. And uh, we are as vulnerable, if not more vulnerable, than a lot of other species. Uh, and we have so much to learn. It seems that a lot of the way we can move forward is is through uh, what's called mimesis or mimetic approaches where we develop ways of living our technologies which follow the ways of nature and there's some fantastic and inspiring examples of all of this mm -hmm. um, so i feel the animals are with us but are we with the animals <laughs> um, we, we are but we're not knowing you know that we're holding that out of the consciousness um, and yeah, there's just some very moving stories that come through in, in terms of that connecting to animal um, consciousness with, through dreams, through experiences, this whole experience, as we're seeing wild animals start to come into cities, you know, probably because they're very hungry and their habitats are being destroyed. But it's, it's, it's a breaking down, there are all these boundaries that our old myths have supported human and nature, human and animal, all those binaries and dualities uh, are really being, being challenged. And, uh, you know, if we can find that compassionate response, mm -hmm. yes, we can find a way forward. Yeah, yeah that relatedness. And, and so, I, I mean, this wraps it all up so nicely because we've just come full circle back to the beginning, and that is how do we engage with the other in groups with relatedness in order to create a container that can hold all of this and bring us into yeah. some kind of a, a new space where, where we can actually take advantage of the transformation that is mm. already available to us because it is. And that's, mm. that's what we need to each hold on to, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's just one you know, fundamental thing, keeping your resilience up around climate change, go on the internet, every day and find some inspiring stories around the kind of breakthroughs of doing things of thinking which are all to do with connectedness with nature and a conscious connected with nature there is some fantastic stuff happening and we really need to hold that as along you know along with the knowledge of the urgency but just you know looking to the kind of breakthroughs because i believe we're well in the process of forming this new myth we can't see it because we're in the middle of it but we're well in the process and there's a lot of examples and stories out there which really illustrate a very different way of being and um holding consciousness of human in world and world and human beautiful well, I just am so grateful for the work that you're doing, Sally. It's, it's really important work. And I feel like you, like uh, many of us actually in this space, are kind of pushing our boundaries a little bit to be able to do this kind of work. But it's truly a labor of love. And I think that it's part of that larger net of things that is calling us. It is a calling on many levels. And so really grateful for the time, the energy, the work that you're putting into this to bring the awareness around climate change and to also bringing opportunities to engage around it. It's really just lovely. So for everybody, I've been speaking to Sally Gillespie, who is a union 
psychotherapist in Sydney, practiced for over 20 years, and is now really focusing a lot of her research on climate change and how to engage around that with a depth psychological lens. And you can learn more about Sally or connect with her via LinkedIn. She has a presence there. And for Sally's free gift for everybody who's attending this, she's going to be offering a chapter from a book. It's a pre-publication draft of Climate Change Imaginings and Depth Psychology reconciling present and future worlds and that's going to be in the book environmental change and world's futures which will be published by Rutledge uh, from J Marshall and L Connor so Sally thank you so much for being willing to share that I can't wait to read it it sounds absolutely fascinating and again thank you so much for for being here with me today well thank you so much Bonnie for that, for today which has been a great um honor and privilege but also for what you've done in putting this whole symposium and set of interviews together it's exactly what we're, we're needing and i'm looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say and to uh, hearing from the community at large that we can all listen to one another around this yeah me too it's it's furthering the work thank you again For more information, visit www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. <laughs>